Well, here we are with Chapter 40, The Resurgence of Conservatism, 1980-1992. We're going to meet Ronald Reagan. Let's get started. A couple of key points. First of all, Ronald Reagan is going to signify the rise of neoconservatism, which we'll discuss in this presentation, obviously. And his Reaganomics, the supply-side dominant economic approach, is going to uh, be somewhat conservative, but also lead to a massive increase in the national debt. And we have the Gulf War now. And again, we're looking at protecting a foreign nation in Kuwait from an outside invasion, but also there's the underlying concern over oil and access to oil. We did touch on the election of 1980 in the previous chapter, but you can see from the election map here that Reagan has significant national support, obviously, with 90, almost 91 percent of the electoral vote. Uh, and he is neoconservative, or we use that phrase to refer to his policies, which oppose big government, support of the common man's rights, and opposed favoritism for minorities. They also supported a free market capitalist system, and they supported anti-Soviet policies. They opposed liberal welfare programs, much of the Great Society. Uh, they opposed affirmative action policies, and they called for the reassertion of traditional values of individualism and the centrality of the family. Family values is key to this idea of neoconservatism. So the Iranians released the hostages on Reagan's inauguration day. Uh, they had spent 444 days in captivity, and Reagan would assemble a conservative cabinet when he took office. A major goal of Reagan was to reduce the size of the government by shrinking federal budget and cutting taxes, and he proposed a new federal budget that called for cuts of $35 billion, mostly in social programs, including food stamps and federally funded job training centers. Uh, there was a failed assassination attempt on March 6, 1981. Twelve days later, Reagan was back in office. All right, so Congress approved a set of tax reforms, including things that would lower the individual tax rates, reduce federal state taxes, and create a new tax-free savings plan for small investors. This is the supply-side Reaganomics that I was referring to before. And these tax breaks are essentially it's a trickle-down approach. It, it was believed that this would give the wealthy more money and industry more money to increase production, spending, and therefore create jobs. And it's also, uh, it was believed, reduce the federal deficit. Now, there was a recession in 1981 and 1982 as the economy slipped uh, and unemployment rose and banks closed. The anti-inflationary policies that caused this recession had actually been created by the Federal Reserve Board during the Carter presidency in 1979. But we're going to see income gaps widen between the rich and the poor throughout this time. And by the mid-1980s, the economy had recovered. Economists speculated that the economy had recovered because of Reagan's massive military expenditures. And Reagan did give the Pentagon nearly $2 trillion in the 1980s, which will unbalance the federal budget and substantially increase the national debt. And if you look at this here, you can see the gap between the wealthy and the poor and how it really begins to separate by the mid-1980s. To say it again with Reaganomics, it is a split from the Keynesian approach that we saw beginning in the 1930s in FDR's New Deal. Keynesianism, again, put the emphasis of economic policy on the demand side, on consumption, whereas Reagan, by contrast, put the emphasis on the supply side or on production. And one last overview, the idea is cut taxes and reduce government spending, with the exception of military spending, which we'll see in a second here, uh, and reduce business regulation and lower inflation. Not a full unregulated economy, obviously, but sort of allowing businesses to operate with less restriction. So as I said, the Cold War will be intensified, and it will include a new arms race. And the idea was that the American economy could defeat the Soviet economy. So let's outspend them, particularly with business. And certainly Reagan did that. In 1983, we have the Strategic Defense Initiative, the SDI, codenamed Star Wars. This is where we had hoped to put satellites in space that could use lasers to shoot down intercontinental missiles. 1981, the Soviets declared martial law in Poland. And two years later, shot down a Korean passenger airliner when it flew into Soviet airspace. By the end of 83, all arms control negotiations were broken, and the Cold War, as I said, was effectively intensified. Here is Reagan on the cover of Time magazine. In addition to that and those concerns, in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, seeking to destroy the guerrilla bases from which Palestinian fighters had attacked Israel. 
Reagan sent peacekeeping troops in, and a suicide bomber killed 200 Marines, and he then had to withdraw that force. In 1979, military advisors had been sent to El Salvador to support a pro-American government. And in October of 83, forces were sent to the island of Granada, and a military coup had killed the prime minister and brought a Marxist regime to power. Here is the devastation caused by that suicide bomber that I mentioned before. Now, despite all of that, Reagan's going to win the election in 1984 with even more gusto. Uh, he defeated the Democrat Walter Mondale, who had a vice president nominee in Geraldine Ferraro, the first female vice presidential nominee. Uh, foreign policy issues dominated Reagan's second term, which we'll see moving forward. But take a look at the election map, and you can see almost almost 98 percent of the electoral vote. Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985. He was committed to reforming the country with two policies, uh, first of which was called Glasnost, which sought to allow free speech and political reform, and the second was Perestroika, which sought to adapt capitalistic economic policies. And these two policies required the Soviet Union to reduce the size of the military and concentrate aid on its citizens, which were certainly in need, and therefore this necessitated an end to the Cold War. Now, in December of 1985, Reagan and Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, <clears throat> which banned all intermediate range nuclear missiles from Europe. And there's Gorbachev there with the trademark birthmark. Reagan had two big issues to deal with. First of all, there were American hostages being held by Muslim extremists in Lebanon. And secondly, Nicaragua was run by left wing Sandinistas. And so to circumvent Congress's ban on sending arms to the Nicaraguan rebels who had fought the Sandinista, Reagan's administration secretly sold arms to Iran, uh, who had helped to free the hostages and then diverted the money from the sales to the rebels. You can see some of the rebels here. Uh, the Contras uh, may be inspiring this fantastic Nintendo game back in the day. Now, 1986, the American people kind of caught wind of this, and this in ignited a firestorm of controversy. Reagan claimed he had no idea of the illicit activities, and there were criminal indictments that were brought against Oliver North, Admiral John Poindexter, as well as Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. This uh, Iran-Contra affair had cast a shadow over Reagan's record of foreign policy. So Reagan's tax cuts and huge increases in military spending cost $200 billion in annual deficits, which added in roughly $2 trillion to the national debt throughout his administration. Um, his large budget deficits helped make future social welfare programs seem economically infeasible. And so, therefore, he did achieve his goal of limiting the expansion of welfare programs. But by the early 1990s, median household income had declined. And you can see here the federal deficit as a percent of GDP increased quite a bit throughout the Reagan administration. Now, the pageant discusses this rise in neoconservatism as sort of a reaction to the counterculture of the late 60s, sort of America pushing back on that liberalism. But there's also a resurgence of the religious right. And in 1979, Reverend Jerry Falwell founded a political organization called the Moral Majority, in which he preached against sexual permissiveness, abortion, feminism, and the spread of gay rights. The organization became an aggressive political advocate for conservative causes. This conservative presidency will also impact the Supreme Court as well. And by the time he left office, Reagan had appointed three conservative-minded judges, including Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to become a Supreme Court justice. You see here. Some conservative decisions of note to attack affirmative action and abortion. First of all, 1989, Wards Cove Packing v. Antonia and Martin V. Wilkes. The court made it more difficult to prove that an employer practiced racial, racial discrimination in hiring. Excuse me. Okay, 1973, Roe v. Wade had prohibited states from making laws that interfere with a woman's right to end abortion during the early months of pregnancy. However, under Webster v. Reproductive Health Services, a Missouri law that imposed certain restrictions on abortion were upheld. States could legislate in an area now, which Roe had previously forbidden them to legislate. We also have Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992. The court ruled that states could restrict access to abortion as long as they did not place an undue burden on the woman. 
All right, so some of the issues that gave the Democrats some leverage in 1988. First of all, Iran-Contra. Second of all, the double mountain of deficits, including the federal budget and the international trade deficit. There's also falling oil prices now. The Southwest USA real estate values and savings and loans institutions were hit very hard by this. $500 in federal money was used to rescue that Southwest. Also, by the way, more banks and savings institutions had closed than at any time since the Great Depression as a result of this. I know it's hard to see the years on this. It's a little blurry, but you can see that oil prices declined significantly towards the late 1980s and into the 1990s. Black Monday, October 19th, 1987, we have a stock market drop of 508 points, which was the largest one-day decline in history. All right, 1988, Michael Dukakis will be the Democratic choice. He was uh, very cerebral, it said, very intelligent, um, but he came across pretty emotionless on TV. Perhaps he didn't have the interpersonal skills that George H.W. Bush had, uh, or Bush 41, as you like to call him, right? He ran on Reagan's record, and... Here he is seen here. Despite the trouble that Reagan may have had uh, with questions about his administration, you can see that the Republicans did win again in 1988, winning roughly 79% of the electoral vote. In 1989, there were thousands of pro-democratic demonstrators in Tiananmen Square in China. And in June of 1989, China's autocratic rulers brutally crushed the movement. I'll show you a picture of the tank man in a second here. In 1989, several communist regimes in Europe collapsed in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and Romania. By December of 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. Um, David Hasselhoff was there in case you're interested in that. And Germany would be reunited in October of 1990. And here is the tank man who stood in front of this line of Chinese tanks uh, and actually at one point climbed on top of it and set something down into the turret. Uh, he eventually was pulled away as he refused to move. And here are those revolutions that we saw here. In 1991, there was a failed military coup to overthrow Gorbachev uh, and he actually would resign a few months later in December of 91. At this point, the Soviet Union had dissolved, and the 15 republics will form a loosely confederated group in the Commonwealth of Independent States. And Boris Yeltsin, who was president of the Russian Republic, would become the dominant leader of the Commonwealth of Independent States. And here is Mr. Yeltsin. With the end of the Cold War, we have other changes as well. There's ethnic warfare breaking out throughout the former Soviet Union. In 1991, the Chechen minority tried to declare its independence from Russia. There's reduced defense spending after the Cold War. That's going to hurt the American economy. 1990, the South African leader Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. Uh, four years later, he was elected as South Africa's president. Again, signaling sort of like this change with apartheid in South Africa. 1990, free elections removed the Sandinistas in Nicaragua from power. And in 1992, a civil war ended in El Salvador. Okay, I'm going to date myself now here. In August 1990, an Iraqi leader named Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and the UN Security Council demanded the immediate withdrawal. The United States would lead a massive international military deployment, sending 539,000 troops to the Persian Gulf region. And in January of 1991, the U.S. and the U.N. launched a 37-day air war against Iraq. The next month, we have Operation Desert Storm. This is sort of the ground war against Iraq. It lasted four days, and Hussein was forced to sign a ceasefire on February 27th. We did not capture him at that point. We allowed him to stay in power. But what's interesting is that I was actually in second grade when this was happening, and I remember distinctly we had a substitute teacher, and he was a younger guy, and he came in, and he was drawing diagrams on the board talking about the American efforts to stop Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and uh, it just kind of caught me. I think that's the time I decided I was going to be a social studies teacher. Here is Iraq, and you can see Kuwait next to it, and obviously Saudi Arabia, where the American and United Nations forces launched their attack from. In 1990, Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, which prohibited discrimination against citizens with physical or mental disabilities. In 1990, Bush's Department of Education challenged the legality of college scholarships targeting 
targeted for racial minorities. And in 1991, Bush nominated conservative African-American Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court, who opposed affirmative action. Here is Bush signing the American with Disabilities Act. Unfortunately for Bush, he has some issues. In 1992, the unemployment rate had exceeded 7%. The federal budget deficit continued to grow. And see, he campaigned on this idea. Read my lips, no new taxes. And unfortunately for him, he had to increase taxes to generate revenue for the federal government. I can't tell you how many times I heard that on TV. No new taxes. No new taxes didn't work out for Bush in the upcoming election. Here it is on the New York Post. And take a look. Donald Trump, future president Donald Trump on the bottom of the front page of the New York Post. And period eight is in the rearview mirror. On we go. Two more to go. It'll be fine. We've already started the review. Less than a month until the big day. Can't wait. If you have any questions, please let me know. Ask me in class or send me an email. Have a great day. and Take care.